Good morning, Meadowbrook Church. As was said, my name is Troy, and I am really honored to be here. I love Meadowbrook Church. I've had a chance uh, to be and speak here a number of times over the past few years. Brian and I have developed a friendship that I have so much respect for Brian, and I appreciate the chance he has to take a little bit of time to invest in uh, his own walk with the Lord this summer a little bit. Um, if some of you are familiar with this 40th birthday party, you might remember me. I did the poetry slam for him, okay? So that is, if you're involved in that, I loved uh, having a fun time with Brian. Anyone, raise your hand if you're familiar. Did you, did you, whoa, did you get a chance to see the Perseids last night? Anyone see the Perseids? Okay, one person. Okay, um, I suppose we're in Tosa, aren't we? It's a little light pollution. But uh, yeah, I was, I was super encouraged. I got home late. I was leading, helping lead a retreat. Um, a bunch of young people last night got home at like 10.30 and woke my daughters up and I said, hey, let's get outside right now. You got to check this out. So we went out on the deck and laid down and just looked up in the sky and it was kind of almost peak and every so often we could see meteor, meteor. It's just like, whoa. And what's beautiful about it was you're looking at this backdrop of the grandeur of God, and then you'd see these closer glimpses. It was just beautiful. And so uh, I want to do that this morning. I want to kind of set a backdrop of the grandeur of God and then see glimpses of it. I, I just want to also confess, I really appreciate the opportunity to be here because this is a confession of maybe like a lead pastor. When I'm at Kettlebrook, when I'm trying to, to do music worship, it's actually on a little bit, honestly, it's a little hard for me because I'm thinking about all the things that are going on in the morning, but this morning I was just really able to worship with you. And so I just, I just want to confess that. I didn't have to worry about what was going on in the hallways, downstairs, whatever. And I was just, so Nate and the team just did a great job. I, I love being here. I want to start us off with a story this morning. And so if you want, you can close your eyes. You don't have to, but I want to, I want to have you imagine with me. We can take ourselves into a little bit of what we're going to look at today. It was 10 in the morning, and Claudius had just finished relieving himself. He had tightened his belt back up and checked the leather straps on his sandals. It was a brief walk from his morning post to his 10 o'clock post. Every four hours or so, they would switch shifts as not to get bored or uh, dulled in their duties. But his 10 o'clock post had become a post that had been both belittling to him and bewildering to him. Belittling because Claudius was one of the emperor's most elite soldiers. And yet, here he was, tasked to watch over one simple, single, aging man. Certainly, a, a child with almost a week's training in a weapon probably could do the job, and yet here he was. He would much rather be on the front lines, much rather be running before the emperor into danger, and here he was in a home watching over one man. And this one man was certainly no threat to anyone. Certainly, he didn't call Caesar Lord. There was that. But he was no insurrectionist. Was he educated? Yes. Was he aggressive? No. And so this post was belittling to him. But it was also bewildering to him because the man that he was charged to guard in this post was such an enigma to Claudius. He was altogether physically unimpressive, and yet when he looked at Claudius, it was as if he could see into his soul. And he would ask Claudius questions that would stir his heart and sit in his gut for days, as if when we have too much garlic, there's breath, garlic breath we have for days. It was similar to that. Before even meeting him, he had heard man, uh, stories about this man, stories that didn't seem probable, let alone possible. They seemed fantastical. And yet here he was, and in person, having met him, he realized this man was not prone to exaggeration, was not prone to fantasy, he was always of sound mind. But he couldn't explain the unexpected strength and confidence and even joy that he had, this man that he guarded. Not a, not a naive joy, not a Pollyanna-ish joy, not a joy that perhaps a child might have playing with a dog they don't realize could absolutely bite them at any given moment. A true, deep, abiding joy that was unhindered, a joy that Claudius could not correlate with the circumstances that this man found himself in. And so Claudius found this man to be compelling. 
Denying Caesar, however, as Lord was no small offense. It's treason and could be leading to execution. And yet there was no tension in this man that he was guarding. There's no tension. In fact, every single day seemed to solidify his resolve, cement his conviction. In fact, he was so bold and so audacious that each and every day he would proclaim that there was another Lord besides Caesar. And at first, Claudius was offended by this. But over time, he actually began to want to hear more. There would be a new truth that was presented that Claudius couldn't deny. There would be a, a new mystery that Claudius couldn't solve. And so he was bewildered and he was confused. And it elevated as people began to come and visit him. You see, as a, as a Roman citizen, this man was under house arrest and he could have people come and visit him. And so they did and they came. And he would dictate letters. And Claudius at first, of course, wanted to listen in to these letters to make sure there was no plans of escape, there was no plans of revolt. But over time, he actually found himself wanting to be present. He actually asked to switch shifts so that he could be there to hear when this man would dictate these letters. But most intriguing to Claudius, most bewildering, was not even this man that he was guarding, but it was the man that he kept speaking about. Could there really be a Lord like that? Could there really be a king like that? And Claudius began to wonder in his heart which of the two of them himself or the man he was guarding was actually in prison. Brothers and sisters, uh, this summer you get, so you're walking through Colossians and you're talking about walking in fullness walking in the fullness of God. And, and when, when we look up in the sky, we get to see a picture of God's majesty. When we see Jesus Christ, we get to see what it looks like to walk in the fullness of God. But we also are blessed with examples of others who are like glimpses of this, like Paul. Paul was a glimpse of this. And, and this morning, what we're going to do is we're going to pause Colossians. Uh, Nate's going to pick back up on it next week. But I wanted to take a little bit of a different look at this from the letter of Philippians. And the reason why is because uh, both of these letters were written by Paul when he was in house arrest, um, some say from Ephesus or Rome. But there's a little difference. Paul never went to Colossae, but he did go to Philippi, and he had this deep and abiding affection for the brothers and sisters there that, that I don't want us to miss. I think it will actually help you enrich your understanding of Colossians as you go through and pick back up in it next week. And so we're going to read through uh, Philippians, and what we're going to see is four pictures, four glimpses that, that, that blaze across the sky in Paul's life of what it looks like to follow in and walk in the fullness of Jesus. And so we're going to do that through Philippians chapter 1. I believe it's on page 1178 in the Bibles that you have in front of you. I would strongly encourage you to grab one of those and read along with me as we go through. We're going to read the whole chapter. So um, I'm going to pray, and then we'll read Gracious Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your word. It is true. It is to be trusted. It will not return void. Father, I thank you that we get to learn more about you. But more than just learning, Father, I pray that you would, by your spirit, inspire us to Christ. May he become greater. May I become less. And anything that's heard this morning, may it be of you. Open our ears and open our hearts to hear. I pray this in Jesus' name. And all God's people said... Amen. Can you stand with me as we read the, God, the Word of God? I'm going to read Philippians chapter 1. Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to all the saints in Christ Jesus at Philippi, together with the overseers and deacons, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God every time I remember you. In all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. Being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. It is right for me to feel this way about all of you since I have you in my heart. For whether I am in chains or defending and confirming the gospel, all of you share in God's grace with me. God can testify how I long for all of you with the affection of Christ Jesus. And this is my prayer, 
that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight so that you may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless until the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. Now, I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. As a result, it has become clear throughout the whole palace guard and to everyone else that I am in chains for Christ. And because of my chains, most of the brothers in the Lord have been encouraged to speak the Word of God more courageously and more fearlessly. It is true that some preach Christ out of envy and rivalry, but others out of goodwill. The latter do so in love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. The former preach Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, supposing that they could stir up some trouble for me while I'm in chains. But what does it matter? The important thing is that in every way, whether from false motives or true, Christ is preached. And because of this, I rejoice. Yes, and I will continue to rejoice, for I know that through your prayers and the help given by the Spirit of Jesus Christ, what has happened to me will turn out for my deliverance. I eagerly expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed, will have sufficient courage so that now, as always, Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. If I am to go on living in the body, this will mean fruitful labor for me. Yet what shall I choose? I don't know. I'm torn between the two. I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is better by far, but it is more necessary for you that I remain in the body. And so convinced of this, I know that I will remain and I will continue with all of you for your progress and joy in the faith, so that through my being with you again, your joy in Christ Jesus will overflow on account of me. But whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ, and then, whether I come and see you or only hear about you in my absence, I will know that you stand firm in one spirit, contending as one man for the faith of the gospel without being frightened in any way by those who oppose you. This is a sign to them that they will be destroyed, but that you will be saved, and that by God. For it has been granted to you on behalf of Christ, not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for him, since you're going through the same struggle you saw I had, and now hear that I still have. This is the word of God. Amen. Go ahead and have a seat. That, that's, that's the whole chapter. It's a lot, right? Do you, do, you, do, you, do you experience the affection that Paul has in here? Do you, you guys hear? <laughs> you experience the affection? You can hear it, right? You can hear it in his writings. Like, I, love, I love you, brothers and sisters. And so um, what, what, what you look at here is he's just writing to these brothers and sisters just like he did in Colossae. Again, he had met these brothers and sisters. And so what we're going to find here is I want to highlight, there's so much to be said about this chapter. I just want to give you four glimpses of what walking in fullness looked like for Paul as we see in Philippians chapter 1. The first one is right away in verse 1. Paul describes both himself and Timothy as servants of Christ. And the word here is actually softened a little bit for us. The, the word is slave. It's slave. He's like, he introduces himself as a slave. Now, if you look at different letters that Paul writes, sometimes Paul writes and says, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, kind of like, here's my credentials. I'm an apostle. Here, he says, Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus. Something I've been wrestling with with our staff team at Kettlebrook is, you know, on Sunday morning, how do I introduce myself? Do I say, hey, I'm Troy, I'm the lead pastor here. Um, I don't really care. And, and I'm not sure that other people should care that much. So we've changed our language a little bit. And I, I just say, hey, I'm Troy, I'm, I'm one of the servants here. I haven't said slave yet. I don't know how that's, I don't think that would necessarily go over. So we're, we're sticking with servant. And we're talking, we're not talking about slavery in the sense that we know the horrific kind of slavery that we've experienced here in this country. We're talking about bonded servanthood. It was a, a little bit of kind of how things played out in there. But it's basically someone who's being subservient to and owned by another in this sense. And he says, Paul says, I am owned by Jesus Christ. I am a slave to Jesus Christ. And I know it sounds a little radical, but I think every one of us in this room probably can relate to this idea of being a slave. Here's, here's how I think I know this. If you've ever fallen in love, you've been a slave. 
and you're a slave to your beloved. Okay, some of you are like, I, I don't know about that, Troy. <laughs> come on now. At least early on, come on, you have this beloved and then you've fallen in love and so they'll, you'll do anything for them, right? I have, my wife and I received, um, saved the date for a wedding of a young couple, a part of our church, and I've known this young guy since he was probably eight years old, okay? And, and to say that he is not touchy-feely would be an, an under, I mean, like, that's not even close to the truth. Like, he just does not like hugs and touching, and, and he, he's not really a smiley kind of guy. He's just straightforward, stoic, if you would. How his fiance got him to look the way he did on their Save the Date card, I have no idea. I mean, I laughed out loud. I got the card open. I'm like, you have got to be kidding me. He's like, I'm like, what is that? You have never made that face ever in your life. And then had someone take a photograph of it. Okay, so, so you know that you're a slave to your beloved when, you're, when you fall in love. Now, God gives us a covenant because guess what? That's going to wear off. That's going to wear off, but God, God says, this is what a covenant is. It means that you will die for one another. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. That is always an ongoing thing, that we would be slaves of our own brides if we're called to marriage. Uh, it, okay, let's say you're not, you haven't fallen in love. Um, and and may, maybe some of you are like, well, I don't know. Anyway, so how about kids? Children, if you've had children, you've understood what slavery looks like in this sense. Because you used to do things. You used to be able to have what's called time. <laughs> and now this tiny human has made you a slave to them. You never even had coffee before and now you're injecting it intravenously <laughs> all day, walking around jacked up on caffeine like I don't even know where I am right now. Because this child cries. And you are a slave to that child. Okay, whatever you want, I guess. So we know to some extent. Paul said, look, I am, I am willingly saying I am a slave to Jesus Christ without hesitation. That's, if you want to know who I am, that's my identity. I'm a slave to Jesus Christ. Brothers and sisters, are you a slave to Jesus Christ? This is something I want you to think about because you are a slave to someone or something. That is a fact. You may be slave, you may say, well, I'm, I don't know, I'm not a slave, Troy, I'm not a slave to anybody. You are so full of it. Okay? Like, we're slaves. We're, maybe we're a slave, you're a slave to your work, and your achievement, and your accomplishments, your 401k. May, maybe you're a slave to uh, a, a desire for affection, or lust, or relationship. Maybe you're a slave to um, winning Maybe you're a slave to technology, the biggest house, what, I don't know. Paul says, Jesus is, I'm, he's my master. I'm his slave. And if we're going to walk in the fullness, we see Paul give us this glimpse of what it looks like to walk in the fullness, and the glimpse begins by us being a slave of Jesus. I had a friend, I have a friend. Three years ago, didn't know the guy. Uh, his wife kind of asked him to come to our Sunday gatherings. He came, started coming. He was, he's an atheist, and spent some time with him, got to hear his story, and he said, yeah, Troy, he's like, I'm not, I'm not huge into God. In fact, when I was in high school, I made myself a t-shirt. I was like, oh, you made yourself a t-shirt. I said, what, are, yeah, tell me about that. He says, yeah, I made a t-shirt and said, Jesus is not my homeboy. And he wore that t-shirt around. And then the more time I spent with him, the more I got to hear some of his story. And he told me, he said, Troy, I, I, I'll be honest. He said, I've been looking for someone to actually be worthy of following my entire life. Someone that I could follow into battle. And I've, I've looked at it, my teachers growing up. I looked, at, I looked for that in um, my, my employers. And every single time I have been let down. He told me that story. And that was true up until about two years ago when he met Jesus Christ. He met him. You want to know where? He met him at the urinal. <laughs> it was during a Sunday gathering. He stepped out and uh, he had to go to the restroom, went to the urinal. And at the urinal, he said, I think I'm done. I think I'm done trying to, like, run things. I, I think I'm done being a slave to other things. And he gave himself to Jesus Christ at the urinal. We call that the sacred urinal at Kettlebrook. Uh, 
A year later uh, or so, got the privilege of baptizing him, and three months ago, took him to Pakistan with me to visit some partners there to see the work that's going on. For the sake of the gospel, he is a slave to Jesus Christ now. It's our first picture. Second picture, after we're uh, slaves to Jesus, Paul writes this, to all the saints in Christ Jesus. Paul uses this word, saint, and we see it here in this next picture. So once we, we admit we're slaves to Christ, then we become saints in Christ. Paul uses the word saint far more than he does sinner to describe followers of Jesus. We're saints in Christ. This isn't reserved to those who perform three specific miracles and give vote. I don't know. Like we're ta he's talking about everybody who has been a slave to Christ has become a saint in Christ Jesus, not just the deacons and the overseers. All the saints, he says. And it means set apart ones. They're set apart not because they're perfect, not because they're righteous in and of themselves, but because they are set apart to reflect Jesus, his character in the world. Which, by the way, shouldn't sound unfamiliar. It's exactly what God had planned in the garden, that, that we would be his image bearers and reflect him to the world. And so as saints, we are set apart. Now, one thing I think we have to be careful of, brothers and sisters, is taking that word and meaning it in such a way that we, we have removed ourselves completely from the world. We are not to be, uh, uh, we're to be in the world, but not of the world. So when we say we're set apart, it doesn't mean we disengage, okay? We've got to be careful of that. But Paul writes to these Philippian brothers and sisters, he's like, I, I miss you. You're saints with me. I love you. They take up a collection for him. Epaphroditus is bringing it with him to prison, take care of Paul. And he's like, I am so thankful. I thank God for you every time, like all the time. I'm thankful for you because your partnership with me in the gospel, you've participated. And he's like, you're walking in fullness. Keep doing it. You're walking. Keep living it. Brothers and sisters, do you live as saints in Christ Jesus? One set apart for his purposes. And so we have slaves of Christ, saints in Christ. And the third one's not as explicit, but it's implicit. It's that we are signposts pointing to Christ, which is our next slide here. Now, if you missed it, in verses 12 through 14, we, we find this. In this next slide, we see this. Now, I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that my circumstances have turned out for the greater progress of the gospel. He's like, my imprisonment in the cause of Christ has become so well known throughout the whole Praetorian Guard and everyone else, and that most of the brothers and sisters trusting in the Lord because of my, like being in prison, have far more courage to speak the word of God without fear. He's like, you, this is how this plays out. You become a slave to Christ. You become a saint in Christ. You also become a signpost pointing to Christ, regardless of your circumstances. So Paul's like, okay, I'm in prison. I'm just going to rock prison ministry right now. That's what he's going to do. He's like, I'm in prison. I'm going to tell every guard that comes here about Jesus, the whole Praetorian guard. And he's like, I'm not telling them about my cause. I'm talking about Jesus and his cause. I want you to think about this. I, I always think about what would it have been like for Paul to be in those circumstances, probably not the best. I think, if, I think if I would be in there, I would say, I'm having a bad day. I, I'm just being honest. What does it take, brothers and sisters, what does it take for you to have a bad day? Be honest. Is it one client complaint and you're like, sideways? Is it one dart from your spouse? Days ruined. Is it an extra minute at the light, the stoplights, and you just lose it? You're like, this is the worst day ever. You go to the grocery store and you're like, this, these lines are ridiculous. You look on social media and someone got invited you to something you didn't get invited to. You're like, this day is the worst. Come on, be honest. We engage in that, don't we? And Paul's like, in prison. <laughs> he is in prison. And he's like, I, my circumstances? have made it so I can point to Jesus while I'm here. I can point to Jesus to the signpost pointing to Christ. And he's not done. Verses 15 through 18 show there's evidence. There's this weird kind of thing going on. Other people are preaching Christ over here and here. And these folks are doing it with good motivation. These folks over here apparently are trying to make it harder for Paul. I don't know the circumstances. We don't know. It's some weird circumstance. And Paul's like, are, are these folks over here talking about Jesus? Yeah, but Paul, they're ripping on you. He's like, I don't care. Who cares? 
As long as they're exalting Jesus Christ, I don't, I, it's not about me. He's just a signpost pointing to Christ. I thought this was powerful that on, on Christmas Day in 1952, there was a 26-year-old woman who addressed one of the most powerful nations in the world at the time, along with 14 other commonwealth nations. And in this broadcast, here's what she said in the broadcast. She said, pray for me that God may give me, give me wisdom and strength to carry out the solemn promises I shall be making and that I may faithfully serve him and you, the people, all the days of my life. Her name was Elizabeth Alexandra Mary Windsor. And six months later at her coronation, Her Majesty the Queen promised three things. I'm not sure you're familiar with these things, but here's three things that Queen Elizabeth promised. So we have them on this next slide. First, to govern appropriately. Number two, to maintain justice. And number three, do you want to guess what this one is? Go ahead and put it up there. To profess the gospel of Jesus Christ. This is what she, and, she, and then she spent seven years of her life, as best as she could, I think, doing that, trying to be a signpost. Even Her Majesty the Queen knew who the real king was. And this is what Paul was talking about. And he's still not even done. If you keep going through there, he's in verse 20. He's like, to live is Christ, to die is gain. He's like, actually, it'd be better for me if I die because I get to be with Jesus. But it'd be better for you if I didn't die because I want you to experience the joy that I have. So because he knows he's a slave to Christ, he's like, all right, I'm going to stay around as long as I can for you so that I can help you experience the joy that I have in Christ. Isn't that amazing? Just glimpses of what it looks like to walk in the fullness of God. And then he says, not only am I a signpost, he's like, I want you to be a signpost too. No matter what your circumstances are, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of Christ. Whatever happens, whatever happens to you, maybe some of you have lost your job recently. I don't know. Maybe some of you have had a spouse leave you, abandon you, cheat on you, Maybe some of you have buried your parents. Maybe, maybe some of you um, are struggling with an addiction. Maybe some of you are struggling to make the bills. I don't know. But what Paul's saying is that whatever your circumstances are, whatever they are, you have an opportunity to conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of Christ in spite of those circumstances. And he says it, and he writes it from prison, so I feel like he brings some weight to that. So help me out, Meadowbrook. So number one, we're to be slaves to Christ. Number two, saints in Christ. Number three, Sign. signposts pointing to Christ. And number four, we are to be sufferers for Christ, sufferers for Jesus. Let's look at, again at verse 29. So this next slide. For to you it has been granted for Christ's sake, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for his sake, experiencing the same conflict which you've seen in me, which now you have as well. I think this one's even harder to swallow than slave. I just, I just do. But Paul makes it sound like they won the lottery. He's like, hey, it's been granted to you to suffer for Jesus. Yeah, you won the lottery. Granted means to bestow generously. It has been bestowed upon you to suffer for Jesus. He says not only to believe in Jesus, but to suffer for Jesus. If I asked you to raise your hand and say, hey, how many of you in here believe in Jesus? My hope and prayer is that you, many of you would raise your hand. If I said, all right, keep your hand up if you're super pumped about suffering for Jesus. Right, well, okay. Maybe not. But I think sometimes we get surprised by this. Surprised by suffering. But suffering, anything that's worth anything involves suffering. Like you think about your favorite artist that you like, enjoy. Someone who's at the top of their game in the, uh, in the, in the athletic world. All of them have suffered to something. There's a cost that's associated with that. You don't get to that level without some kind of actual suffering. You have to let go of some other things to make that happen. How about this? Something very practical I think about. I have some good friends who are part of law enforcement, who are part of EMT and firefighters in West Bend, and I get to hear their stories. And, and 
when those cars fly by with their lights on, we are praying for them because here's what's happening. Everyone else is going this way and they're going towards trauma. Every time. They're going to walk onto a scene that probably will be traumatic. And so we say, God, would you please bless and protect those who are going to serve in that way every single day. There is a cost. There is suffering that is involved in that. But I think so often we don't always understand suffering. Now, one of the coolest connections that we have as two churches, Kettlebrook and Meadowbrook, is that we have a couple that we're familiar with together, and that's Eric and Molly Croner. Not all of you probably know them, but can you just raise your hand if you know Eric and Molly Croner? Okay, there's, they're your supporting missionary partners. If you're newer, uh, Eric is a, a physician. He's a doctor who's from this area, okay? He grew up actually in West Bend. But he and his wife, Molly, are missionaries in Chad, Africa. And I got to pick Eric up from uh, the airport on Thursday night. See, here's the little secret. Sorry, Meadowbrook. You're their sending church, but his mom lives in West Bend, so we get to see them more than you. <laughs> Eric is a dear friend of mine. I got to hang out with him, pick him up from the airport. But their, their team in Amtamad, Chad, like there's no, none of them there are like, I don't know about, I don't know, like suffering? Hmm. One car accident a few years ago took out three, killed three of their team members. Another car accident took out one of their team members. They've had someone kidnapped. They've had people come back off the field due to illnesses. And some of you probably have heard the story of Sally. If you haven't heard the story of Sally, you need to ask, tell me the story of Sally. She's the first believer in Amtaman. And, and her following Jesus has really involved a lot of her being locked in a closet by her uncle with her children without food for days at a time because she loves Jesus. And we get upset because we're, there's a line at the grocery store. Come on now. I'm just being honest. I'm not saying you. I'm saying we. None of them are surprised by suffering for Christ. And Paul's like, it has been granted to you. It has been bestowed graciously upon you that we get to suffer for Jesus Christ. A friend of mine said recently, we were talking about God, and they said, I've, I've pulled away from being close with God because every time I draw near, something bad seems to happen. And I, I get it. I empathize with that. I want to shepherd them through that. It's a, it's a physiological, psychological defense mechanism. And yet what I think that maybe we're missing in that is that perhaps God is actually, you know, not bringing some sort of suffering upon us per se, but allowing us to experience what He experiences the suffering that he has gone through ever since the first day where we decided instead of being, uh, letting God be our master, that we've said we want to be our own masters and we became masters, uh, we became our own masters, which means we became slaves to sin. And ever since sin entered the world, bad things happen. They happen every single day. There's bad things happening right now, but not just out there. Right in here. Right here. And so perhaps... When we, when we experience suffering, we actually are able to draw nearer to God and experience what He experiences because of what we have done. The radical nature of God is experienced in this way when we suffer. Paul says in Philippians chapter 3, to know Christ, to know Christ. He's like, everything else is complete garbage except knowing Christ through, number one, the power of His resurrection and, number two, the fellowship of His sufferings. It's like, I would... It's all worthless except to know Christ. And that can be done either through the power of his resurrection fellowship of his sufferings. And so I am overwhelmed when I read this from Paul because here was what we find. We find glimpses of Paul, like the Perseids screaming across the sky, but in the backdrop there's this beautiful picture of the majesty of God who he himself did all four of these things in Christ Jesus. Jesus himself, who came, who came to be a slave, who came to serve. Not to be served, but to serve. So that we could be free. Jesus Christ who, um, yeah, he was set apart. He was set apart so that we might be called saints. Jesus Christ, who wasn't just a signpost pointing to the Father. He said, I am the way. I am the way. And Jesus Christ, who didn't just suffer, but died for you and for me so that we can enjoy joy and freedom and hope through our Lord and King Jesus. Isn't that beautiful? Brothers and sisters, can I get an amen? amen? It's the gospel. It's so beautiful. We get glimpses 
of walking in fullness with Paul. He's experienced Christ, Paul did, and he's walking in fullness, and he's all four of these things on, on behalf of the Lord and in front of others as well. Now, in my opening story, I shared about Claudius. I was making that up. You know that. I don't know it's exactly how things happen, but I know that Paul was under, he was under a house arrest, and, and so my guess is it's close to maybe what happened because there's something that happens at the, at the end of the book of Philippians, almost as if Paul closes the book with a little bit of a smile and a wink. Here's what, here's what we read at the end of Philippians, this next slide. Greet all the saints in Christ Jesus. The brothers who are with me send greetings. All the saints send you greetings, especially those who belong to Caesar's household. Brothers and sisters, how in the world were there saints in Caesar's household? How did that happen? I don't know, but I'd like to take a guess. Perhaps it happened because of a guy named Claudius. A guy who was in proximity with a man who just gave glimpses of Christ. A guy who was a slave to Christ, a saint in Christ, a signpost pointing to Christ and a sufferer for Christ. May we someday experience and understand that perhaps by walking in fullness like that, there may be others, Caesar's household and other households, places here in Wauwatosa, places around the world that have come to call themselves saints because of seeds that have been planted by us walking in fullness in these ways. As the, as the team comes back out, we're going to sing one more song before we do that, I want you to, to take a moment. I want to put this last slide up with the four pictures on it. And I just want to give us a moment to actually take a little bit of time and reflect on this and ask ourselves the question, in what ways does this, do these images, these reflections, these glimpses, in what ways do these resonate with me? And in what ways might God be drawing me nearer to live out these elements of the fullness of God for the sake of His glory. So I'd like us just to take a moment, and then perhaps I would, I would challenge you to say, when you, when you get in the parking lot, that you wouldn't just start talking about, I don't know, whatever, but that you talk about this, and you'd say, hey, let's process this together. Let's do this together. So Father, I pray and thank you for my dear brothers and sisters. I pray, Lord, that you would inspire us to Christ. Father, help us to willingly, obediently be slaves to your son, Jesus. He's the only one worthy of it. Help us, Father, to understand that we, there's, there's no place that we have. We're seated, in the high, we're seated in the heavenly realms right now because we're saints in him. Let's live that way. Help us to do that, Lord. Help us, Father, to be pointing everyone that we encounter to him and help us to be willing and able and, and perhaps even excited to suffer for his sake, that you'd be given glory. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.